Good day chaps. So today's quick video is going to revisit the American Astron project to look at one of the more unusual vehicles designed during the Cold War. It's a transforming, articulated, multi-part combat vehicle that could operate as a main battle tank or a series of smaller independent machines which can be put together in the field or taken apart and fired everything from missiles to AA guns and very special armor piercing rounds. This is the Chick and Hen concept by Continental Motors. In a previous video we covered the Weapon X tanks as part of the Astron project, but we can always recap quickly. The story began with the replacement or the improvement of the M47 beginning in 1951 as part of the T-48 project. This led to a conference held at the Detroit Arsenal in March 1952 to review these new designs. The conference, called Operation Question Mark, was one of the first of several such meetings to encourage interaction between the designers, industry heads and the users and operators of the tanks who often had conflicting interests and ideas. With the success of the first question mark conference, Detroit Arsenal then presented a research and development contract in April 1952, and several odd tanks were presented, including the Yo tanks which we covered in another video. Following this, a memorandum by the Army Chief of Staff, General Collins, on the 10th of January 1953, notes the design policy for research and development should keep two parallel paths. Like the previous projects, these looked at firstly the improvement and evolution of existing vehicles, and the other option was the development of new solutions to old design problems. General Collins, however, was very aware that by having the military issue a list of restricting prerequisites to any potential concept, often based on what worked before, you drastically reduce the odds of anything new or innovative being developed. It's a bit like me asking you to design a new fruit, except that it must be round, and it must be orange in colour, and it must taste like this, but be a considerable improvement over that. And so a blank sheet contract was issued, to see what new or innovative ideas could be drawn up. This wasn't entirely without rules. Only firms with a proven track record of research and engineering as well as the staff and capability to undertake the work required were eligible, and at least two firms must have had previous experience in tank design, and that any design be ready for 1958, which was later increased to 1961. The Ordnance Technical Committee then issued a project named Astron on the 24th of April 1953. The first initial proposals and napkins were reviewed at the Detroit Arsenal and then the Pentagon during May and June of 1953 and contracts were awarded to General Motors and Chrysler as the two civilian firms. However, Chrysler would then pull out of the contest and Continental Motors would fill the gap in December that year with Detroit's own Ordnance Tank Automotive Command joining in as well. The firms then presented their vehicles to the Pentagon on the 17th and 18th of May 1955. From General Motors there was the Weapon X, a shapely and hard hitting but fundamentally light tank that we covered previously. While the Ordnance Tank Automotive Command presented the Rexes, a series of vehicles from the conventional to the more unusual, many featuring composite steel and liquid armours, oscillating turrets and other new features. And then we have the Chick and Hen. This vehicle was the Continental Motors design and is by far the oddest of the collection. The basic concept was to take the idea of commonality to the extremes in that one system can fulfill a series of missions and be taken apart and reconfigured in the field. The primary vehicle was known as the Hen, consisting of a long 10 meter platform made from connecting two smaller automotive vehicles in a back-to-back -back configuration with an articulated middle system housing the turret and the fighting compartment. The Hen would be transported into battle intact or in segments by helicopter and a series of built-in jacks and a rig allowed it to be slotted together. 
Meanwhile, the automotive units were also the basis for a smaller series of supporting tanks called chicks. These came with fire support weapons or other accessories to help the hen fight in the field and each, if needed, could be broken down and rebuilt to counter whatever threat was present on the day. So let's take a look at the hen first, as this is the main fighting body. And while it might look like it was made by Hasbro, please bear in mind this is actually a very real project. As we said, it's made of three parts. The two automotive units, each an armoured tracked vehicle consisting of a driver's compartment, power plant, fuel tanks and a connecting port. The engine in each unit was a multi-fuel 90 degree V 8 cylinder 4 stroke turbocharged air cooled engine. Power was then delivered through a hydroelectric torque converter with planetary gear sets providing four speed ranges both forward and reverse and a double differential steering and wet disc brake system incorporated into the transmission. Each power unit could be further removed via a large access port in the unit's top. Two of these units were provided for every hen, and how it arrived depended on when and where it was needed. If the vehicle was able to arrive in one piece, it was planned to put the hen, as a whole, into the proposed Douglas C132, a colossal plane that got as far as a full-size mock-up, able to carry 800 troops, or in this case, one complete hen and two chicks over 3,000 miles, to wherever they were needed and in the event of not being able to land this chonky plane near to where the tank was required, the vehicle was split into three pieces, each weighing 30,000 pounds or 15 tons. These could then either be airdropped individually by a Hercules C-130, each with its own self-inflated pallet that once grounded, in theory, allowed all three parts to link up. Now you might be thinking this is completely bonkers, but it's not quite as mad as you think particularly as this project was about encouraging new ideas over conventional ones. There were some advantages to the design, notably around the use of articulation. The notion of articulated military vehicles is nothing new, and it's been around for almost as long as vehicles have been used in combat, but with tanks it's a wee bit rarer, though again not a new concept. Martel designed an articulated tank in 1935, which highlighted the benefits of such a vehicle, notably lower ground pressure, improved turning radius, and better ground traction over different terrain types, where a longer track base can lose traction, particularly on crossing ridges. Articulation in tanks has also been studied as a way of overcoming that crucial issue in AFE design, the dimension and volume aspects. By not limiting yourself to a conventional shape, you can afford to have more leeway in where you place required modules and components. The Swedish, for example, heavily investigated articulated vehicles in some of their UDES designs, with the external gun up front, the crew in a lower pod, and the vulnerable ammunition in the rear modules. While other research has been done by both the Soviets and the Americans, and many nations use articulated vehicles today as well. So the thinking behind the HEN was not as radical as one might think, although generally they do arrive to the battlefield in one piece. Once assembled, the tank had many of the benefits of a normal vehicle. Its turret and inbuilt fighting compartment had a 360 degree rotation and a gun elevation of plus 20 and minus 10 degrees all round, with full power traverse. But from there on, once again it gets a bit weird. The armoured fighting compartment sported an auto-loading 19mm rifled liquid propellant gun stabilised in both azimuth and elevation. Now I'm not going to go into too much depth on LP guns as in a few days I'm back at the archives and digging out 10 plus boxes on this subject for its own video tied with future main battle tank. But briefly an LP gun uses a caseless round and injects the propellant in a liquid form behind the round. This on paper offers much better options regards to internal volume, and in theory is safer in many ways. However, although the idea has been tried and tested since 1944, they've never quite got the system to work correctly, or more importantly, consistently. But due to the potential benefits, LB guns have been tried and tested for the last 70 years, and I very much doubt that they're going to fade away as new technologies and materials come to light. 
While just having an LP gun would not mark the vehicle out as extraordinary in this time frame, the ammunition choice did. The 90mm came with two rounds, both designed by the Detroit Controls Corporation, the same people who were also working on LP guns at this time. The first was a fairly regular white phosphorus round, primarily used to lay smoke for the vehicle, but also to double as a rather effective and nasty anti-infantry round due to its burning ability, particularly in enclosed areas. The second round, however, was something else. This was an armor-piercing, ramjet-powered supersonic shot. Once the autoloader fed the round into the magazine and the liquid charge placed, it would fire the round. This would enable the ramjet to work, preventing the round from losing velocity at range and increasing its maximum velocity after it fired. The core of the ramjet was the AP round itself and the rest was built around it. Other armament considered of the Commander's Cupola equipped the .50 in a rangefinder, as well as a coaxial .30 alongside the main gun, and a further .30 ball-mounted gun which could be fitted to either side of the turret for close protection. The fighting compartment had three crew, the Commander, Gunner and Loader, although quite why there is a loader I'm not sure, and the one or two drivers for a total of four to five crew. In the first part we looked at the hen side of the vehicle, and now we can look at the chicks and the ancillary weapons. The support platforms for the HEN were split into two categories, the chicks and the ancillary systems. Both the chick and the support units used the basic automotive part of the Astron project, which could then be switched out to form several new vehicles, from a basic tractor recovery vehicle to a dedicated 105mm light tank, a missile launcher firing cannonballs, the ramjet MLRS and an anti-aircraft vehicle. So we'll start with the Chick. This was the most common of the vehicles of which two would accompany any hen. These were light 20-ton two-man vehicles with the same engines and suspension as the primary unit but designed for high rate of fire support against infantry and light armor or to outflank and engage heavier armor while the hen deals with more difficult ground targets. The chick could be delivered with the hen or airdropped into action to guard the hen while it's been put together. The driver sat to the front left while the gunner was in the turret's module right hand side. Now the hen's weapons were a bit weird and of course so were the chicks. In order to fit a 105mm gun into such a small detachable frame they went with a fully automatic 105mm rigidly mounted rocket boosted gun with a 10 round drum magazine that only fired heat or high explosive. So basically it's a 105mm heavy bolter. Once empty, the rounds are then manually loaded again from inside the turret by the lone gunner who had a further 20 rounds in the module. The gun was powered in azimuth and elevation and was fully traversable with an elevation of plus 20 and gun depression at minus 10. To assist with aiming, there was a pulsed light opto range finder fitted to the gun's left hand side, and for secondary support, a remotely controlled .30 machine gun was also provided. If the chick was not required for the situation at hand, it would return to base and the entire gun module would be taken off. This would then allow another module to be plugged in, and there were several to choose from and these were called the ancillary systems. So in no particular order we'll start with the AA system. This was a twin 30mm module that plugged into the back and mounted two 30mm liquid propelled machine guns based on modified naval T121B cannons with 360 degrees of traverse, 90 degrees of elevation and 5 degrees of depression as well as a coaxial mount for the .30 machine gun. But other than that, they don't go into too much detail. The next one up is the D-40 Cannonball. Now this is an unusual vehicle in that it was the proposed anti-tank guided missile system to be plugged into the Astron unit. And just like everything else, they couldn't help but find the oddest weapons. In this case, the very real but rare D-40 Cannonball missile. The D-40 was originally built as a submarine weapon to engage light ships and was designed by the Applied Physics Laboratory at John Hopkins University in Maryland. 
This didn't pan out, however, and the Army took interest in 1952 to further the range and stopping power of guided missiles, and work began on a series of cannonballs, which came in a few flavours. The cannonball missile was a sphere with one primary nozzle angled down at 45 degrees to give both lift and thrust, and then a series of rocket nozzles around the sphere to stabilise it in flight. The original version weighed some 300 pounds, and these were radio controlled. However, a lighter 150 pound wire guided version was also built and tested. These weapons came with either a 50 pound heat or 65 pound high explosive plastic or Hesh warhead, which made them some of the most powerful missiles of their time. The description given in the Astron brochure was for a radio controlled missile of 22 inches, which lets us know it was the D40A 300 pound version. This missile would shoot up and then out of its enclosed tube and be steered to its target up to three kilometers away. So swiftly moving on, we have the Ramjet MLRS. This is described as a carrying rack for transporting and launching six eight inch rocket Ramjet missiles with a range of 30,000 yards with a 40 or 50 pound high explosive warhead. Now the ramjet rocket aspect is not that uncommon and in fact is fairly sensible. What is more curious is quite who in the image given is to operate this system. There's only one crewman this time and that's the driver in the enclosed position. So quite how this is supposed to have worked is a bit of a mystery. And the last is by far the most sensible vehicle out of the entire damn project. It's a trailer unit. A simple Astron mobility unit attached to a tow trailer for dragging all this bloody nonsense away and returning later, hopefully with a more sensible design. Well guys, that's the end of the Astron chicken hen video. Needless to say, it was never ever destined to go very far, with the purpose of this project to look outside of the box. However, this team seemed to have chewed their way through a pharmacy box to do so. This was a case of far too much untested technology and ideas in one package and remains one of, if not the oddest, US proposals that took part in any official design investigation. Well guys, we'll leave you on that. Until next time, toodle pip.